are the host, please mute your Thank you. You are the only participant in the conference. Crazy, they're gonna go ahead and get this morning service started. Amen, amen. All right, good to have you all with us. Those of you who are in the, those of you who are in the sanctuary, as well as those who are coming into uh, the live stream. Uh, I hear a number of people online, teleconference. Glad to have you with us. Glad to have everybody on this beautiful Sunday morning. Amen. I'm glad to be in God's house today to give him worship and praise because he's worthy. God is worthy of our praise. Amen. Amen. He is so worthy of our praise. He's kept us this week, watched over us, protected us, provided for us. We've had sweet communion with the Holy Spirit during our times of study and, and of worship and of prayer and of meditation. God has met us where we were, amen. He's opened doors for us and created opportunities that we couldn't create for ourselves. We've had an opportunity to represent him in the earth and to be a light in the world that is growing darker by the day, amen. And it's a great time to be a believer because the darker the night, the brighter the light, amen. And I believe that we're shining during this season because the world is looking for an answer. They're looking for hope, they're looking for peace, they're looking for joy, they're looking for, for love. And they should be able to find all those things in us and among us. Hereby will they know that you are my disciples. By how you love one another. Amen. So we are just grateful to be uh, members of the kingdom of God today. As we go to worship and prayer and praise, as always, we're asking everybody to participate. Even if you're not here in the sanctuary with us. Amen. In your living room, office, car, wherever you are right now, we're asking you to join us in this praise and worship as we sing the songs of Zion to the extent they're familiar to you or you can kind of catch on to the chorus. Amen. Sing the songs with us. It does something to our human spirit to sing praise to God. How many of you know that? Have you ever been in a situation where you were feeling drained or challenged and you just started singing the hymns? Amen. And the, the joy was restored and strength was restored. Amen. That happens. That happens when you commune with the Holy Spirit. So we're encouraging you to join in with us. Whatever you're feeling, however you're feeling, whatever you're going through, we're going to give God a sacrifice of praise. Amen. And we're going to start to do that right now. Amen. By being led to praise and worship by our musician. Amen. We're praying for her. She... Uh, Incurred an injury uh, early yesterday at, uh, evening. Amen. She's at home recovering, so we thank God for that. So we're praying for you, Sister Precious Michael. But as we do that, we're going to sing along to a couple of your recordings at this time. Amen. Let's sing together. <laughs>
Victory is mine. Praise the Lord. I just said that when I was putting gas in my car today. $5.79 a gallon. Victory is mine. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Victory is mine. I'm just so glad. God provides. At least I was able to put gas in my car. Amen. I'm praying for those who are struggling today. Amen. God be their supply. Amen. So glad again to be in the house of God. Good to see all of you here in the sanctuary. Of course, we invite our members back into the sanctuary to be able to worship and praise with us safely, social distance, wearing masks, uh, seated very far apart. Amen. We encourage you all to be with us. Glad to have those of you in the sanctuary with us, those on the teleconference with us, and those on the live stream, those watching by uh, YouTube. So glad that we can use all of these different tools to be able to get the word out. Amen. God's doing some wonderful things in the church with us expanding our horizons and being creative in how we deploy the word of God and celebrate him and come together and worship. Amen. But everything's a poor substitute for body fellowship. So glad to have you all here with us. Amen. Uh, just a couple of announcements. One is today at the uh, Mount Olive Church of Christ Holiness under Pastor Linwood Young. Their women will be celebrating their annual CWWW Day at 3 p.m. Uh, their, their theme is Women on the Move. Their guest speaker is Bishop C. Bridgewaters. Amen. So they're inviting us to be with them today. Again, that's a 3 p.m. service at the Mount Olive Church of Christ of Holiness. Um, we want to remember in prayer those who have lost loved ones. Sister Viola Swan lost a cousin. And of course, she recently also lost a sibling. So we're continuing to pray for her. Amen. We're also praying for the Ross family. Uh, Brother Frank Ross went home to be with the Lord this past week. And so we're praying for the Ross family here uh, at our own church, Bethel Church. We're also praying for the church family there in Pasadena. He was a member uh, at the Bethlehem Church in Pasadena for well, well over 20 years, I know for sure. Amen. So we're praying for you, Bethlehem family, that God would encourage your hearts and lift you all up and that God be blessed by whatever homegoing services will uh, occur in commemorating his life. So we pray for the Ross family. We pray for Sister Viola Swan and her family. We're praying for those who are sick again. Sister Precious Michael suffered a, a fall uh, early evening yesterday. Uh, we were with her at the hospital till well past midnight last night. So I know she's at home resting. Uh, she was in great pain this morning. The pain had eased somewhat. So we're praying that that would continue and God would expedite that. Um, we're also praying for Sister Witt, who had a surgery yesterday. Her thyroid was removed. So we're praying for uh, speedy and painless recover, recovery for her. It was outpatient surgery, so she was able to go home yesterday after the surgery. But of course, there will be some recovery period for that. So again, we're praying, uh, amen, for her. Uh, there are those who are on our sick and shut-in list that we continue to pray for. We want to continue to, amen, lift them up in prayer. Uh, Sister Gladys Mickleberry, Deaconess, uh, Correa Staten, again, Sister Viola Swan, praying for her health. And my mother-in-law, Sister Grace Rice, we continue to pray for Elder Curtis Smith. Amen. Uh, and also we're keeping Deaconess, Deaconess Gladys Brackenridge on our sick and shoulder list in the short term, just to ask God to completely bring her to full strength uh, as he moves her forward and we celebrate her victory, God's healing, amen, in her life. There are others, names I have not mentioned, but they're out there. Sister B. Johnson, we continue to pray for. Amen. There are others that we have not mentioned, but I'm going to ask you as we go to prayer uh, here in a minute or so to remember those names. Amen. Amen. Uh, and again, Sister June, none of us have met, but her mother blindly reached out to us a few months ago and said, hey, my daughter's struggling. She's entering a period where she'll need another surgery. Uh, June uh, has had multiple surgeries. She's had uh, infections. She's dealt with cancer. And now they're looking to reconstruct her knee. 
uh, and she's concerned about that surgery, but we're trusting God, not only to bring her through physically, but also to, through this, draw her closer to himself, that she might count, conquer her anxieties and her fears. And we're praying that for all of you who are in need of prayer, uh, because you are sick, because you're struggling financially, because you're struggling relationally, because you're struggling mentally, because you're struggling relationally. We're asking God to reconcile broken relationships. We are praying for you. Perhaps you have a special request from the Lord. Uh, you're looking forward to a promotion or you're, you need extra help in school. Amen. Because you're a student. Whatever your need is, God is able to supply. Amen. Would you go in faith with us to prayer uh, at this time? Father God, we thank you for your loving kindness and your grace towards us. And as I stand in your presence, I stand on the behalf of many. On the behalf of many. God, you, you know our love for you. You know our commitment uh, to you. You know that we are uh, members, citizens of your kingdom, and we seek to represent you in the earth. And so we just glorify you at this time. We glorify you. Our very presence in this service is meant for us to lock arms and hearts, to sing your praise and to testify of your goodness and your grace. Because God, you've been wonderful to us. We think about your goodness now. We think about what our ends could have been. Uh, as the saints of old used to say, we could have been resting on the cooling board and we're not. Because you yet have purpose for our lives. And God, we desire to be used by you. We have children, grandchildren, spouses, parents, grandparents, nieces, cousins, nephews, aunts, uncles, neighbors, and friends, co-workers who aren't saved yet. They don't know you in the part of their sin. And our mission here is to declare your gospel so that souls might be converted, so that the lost might be reconciled back to you, Father. And it's our desire that you use us in that way. We have a testimony of your saving grace. What you've done for us, we know you'll do for others. Help us to tell our story, and in telling our story, to tell your story. The power of your gospel, a gospel that raises the dead, that causes the blind to see and the lame to walk, a gospel that gives us spiritual strength in all those ways and restores spiritual life, that gives us life and life more abundantly. Help us to share that gospel, that good news of who Jesus Christ is, and the purpose he serves in our lives to be bishop over our souls. Help us to share that gospel, that reanimating, reviving gospel. Let us tell it with power and with clarity. That's our prayer. We pray it in Jesus' name. As we come together in this service, God, we pray that all things be done to your glory. The songs that we have already sung, the prayer that we are now rendering, the praise that we offer, may it be acceptable in your sight. God, we love you so much today. We love you so much today. And you and only you know truly how real that is. Have your way in us. Have your way through us. That's our prayer. God, we have mentioned so many names. You know what each one of those needs are. And we're praying that you meet all at the point of their need and that you show yourself strong in and through their lives. Lord, we trust you today. We trust you to be everything that you said you are and to do everything you've promised to do. We trust you. And where we've fallen short, committed sin, are carrying weights through this life. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness as only you can do. Keep us in right relationship and fellowship with you. In Jesus' name we ask these things of you. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. And God bless you. Amen. This morning we're going to ask that you turn your Bibles as we prepare for a message and song to the book of Exodus. Turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus. 
chapter 12. Book of Exodus chapter 12, as you're doing that, this is a reminder uh, for those of you who give digitally, if you have not already done so, to do so at this time. Uh, for those in the sanctuary who want to give a, a live offering, we'll put the plate out after service as we have been doing. But um, for those of you who are giving digitally, this is your time to do it. Bethel, C-O-C-H at gmail.com. I suspect we kind of know that now. Bethel, C-O-C-H at gmail.com. For those of you who are mailing it in, P.O. Box 11664. P.O. Box 11664. Los Angeles, 90011. Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 12, we'll be looking at verses... 21 through 38. Let's say amen now as Sister Precious comes to us with a message in song. <laughs>
attention to the book of Exodus chapter 12. Now we're going to begin reading at the uh, 21st verse. Exodus 12, 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel at the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass. When ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshiped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Amen. He would go on to call Moses and Aaron by night. He would say, rise up and get ye, get you forth from among my people, both you and your children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord, as you have said. If we go down to verse 37, it says, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children, and a mixed multitude a mixed multitude went up also with them and flocks and herbs and every much cattle. The Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Father, I thank you today for your grace and for your goodness and for the next few minutes I pray you would speak by your Holy Spirit to us, your people, revealing to us your precious promises and truths, directing us how we should live better in your presence. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, you know, we're coming up upon Easter. We're about, what, three weeks or so from it? And it's a high time for Christians. I would argue Easter is much more of a Christian day than Christmas. 
um, because in part of, in part due to this Passover promise and the Lord's uh, or the Father's uh, direction to his people that they observe it forever, forever. This wonderful thing that he has done for them. And then, of course, if we have studied the book of Hebrews and other New Testament scripture, we know that We know that um, what Jesus Christ does on the cross is that he becomes that paschal lamb, that sacrificial lamb. The shedding of his blood brings about the remission of our sins. And the destroyer that they would have feared in the day of Moses operates today. And but for the blood of Jesus, we too would be victims of God's judgment. But we are covered by his blood, just as in this day that we have just read of, there were homes covered by the blood of the sacrificial lambs. Let's talk about that today. In this part of Exodus, we're picking up in the middle of a great account where Moses returns back to Egypt at God's direction. And he is told to let Pharaoh know that Pharaoh is to let God's people go. Of course, Egypt had been enslaving the Hebrew people, the people of God, and it was time for Pharaoh to let God's people go. So Moses speaks on behalf of God, but Pharaoh's heart is hard and he refuses to respond to God's demand. And so there are 10 signs of judgment upon Egypt. These signs are a battle between gods. Uh, on the one side, you have the living God, Yahweh. Uh, and he is represented by Moses and Aaron. On the other side, you have the gods of Egypt dead gods, gods who are only gods as a figment of imagination. They are, are in no way real, but many Egyptians believe they are and serve these gods. And these gods are represented by Pharaoh and his magicians. In the first round of judgments, as we're leading up to uh, the death of firstborn, we have the Nile turning into blood, the Nile River turning into blood. We have uh, this, this plague of frogs, and then there is a plague of gnats. These first rounds of plagues are a battle between Aaron and Pharaoh's <coughs> magicians, right? Uh, and the sorcerers can mimic the first two, but they can't mimic the third. In the second cycle, it's Moses and Aaron together against Pharaoh and his magicians. And there is a plague of boils, sores, open sores on the body that Pharaoh and his magicians cannot mimic. And in the final cycle, Aaron fades to the background, and now it's simply Moses and Pharaoh. There is an escalation of these plagues. There is a progression in what is happening before our very eyes. Watch this. The waters of the Nile are the beginning of the cycle. And from there, the waters go, uh, the plagues go from water to ground, frogs, amphibious animals. The third plague is gnats. Comes when Aaron strikes the dust of the ground. 
From the ground we move to the air with the swarms of flies, and then to the animal flesh, the livestock, they die. And then there is the human flesh, the boils, the open sores on the skin, and from the flesh we move to the sky as the thunder and the hail and the fire fall on Egypt, and then as locusts swarm on the east wind. And then finally the plagues reach the heavens as God turns off the lights in Egypt, day becomes night, plunges them into darkness, a darkness so pervasive that you can literally feel it. So we go from the water to the ground, from the ground to the air, from the air to the flesh, from the flesh to the sky, from the sky to the heavens. The plagues are God's supernatural authority being demonstrated over Pharaoh and Egypt. Is it possible that we are seeing, listen, is it possible? I'm just asking the question, is it possible that we're seeing that same demonstration of God's supernatural authority and judgment over the world today? Is it possible? Here's what I would submit to you for your, for your thinking before you answer that question. The fact that we also see plagues in the water. How many of you know that there are fish just turning up by the tens of thousands dead in the water? It's unknown why it's happening. There are some theories but nothing proven outright in many of these cases. Fish by the thousands are just floating in the water, dead, all seemingly at once. If you don't believe me, you can look it up. It's happened this year in the month of January. And I need somebody to mute your phone on the teleconference, please. Kind of bothersome. Amen. Bless the Lord. Got to love technology. Amen. We just go roll with it and let it go. There you go. Amen. If you don't believe me, you can look it up in the news that just this year, fish have turned up dead in the water just off the coast of Mexico in Puerto Vallarta. And it's not the first time it's happened. It's just the most recent incident of it happening. May God be beginning a great judgment of the earth before our very eyes in our generation. Much the way he did in Egypt, might it be happening again in our generation? We talk about plagues. Not too many years ago, we were concerned about avian flu, the bird flu, wondering if it was going to sweep over the world and kill massive numbers of people. It did its damage, but it was contained. But then there was also Ebola, a recurring plague that mostly touches the continent of Africa. But we here in America felt safe, right? Because we're God's new chosen people, right? But then COVID happens. And now we can't just say it's the bird flu in Asia or it's the Ebola in Africa. Now it's COVID everywhere. Nobody goes untouched. Amen. Is it possible that God's judging the sinfulness of the world? Right. And he's visiting upon us his supernatural judgments so that we might know that he's still in charge. And no matter what kind of science we have at our disposal, when God judges humanity, nobody can escape it. We can't say here in America, we're special because we're a Christian nation and we love the Lord. Neither of those things are true. We are not immune from God's judgment and we are not a Christian nation. We can't call ourselves that just because we've decided that that's the attachment and the association we want to have. When our behaviors do not demonstrate at the highest levels that we're committed to the cause of Christ. Is it possible? I'm just asking the question here this morning. Is that 
to you. As they say at Fox News, I report, you decide. Is it possible that God is judging the world? So there are two things that as an oracle for God, as, as a man called by God, there are two things this morning that God has moved me to put before you so that we can see the relevance of Passover, not just in its historical context and not just in its theological context and how it applies to Christ and what he's done, but that we can see Passover as it applies to us today. How, how God is moving today in a very similar way. Two things I want to make you aware of. The first is that Passover touches two groups of people. The first group I want to talk to are those who were God's chosen. The Israelites, the Hebrew people. God spared the people of Israel some of the earlier plagues just because. Please take note that when those first nine plagues happened, there was nothing special required of the Israelites. God, by his own grace, undeserved kindness, unmerited favor for you Sunday school students. God, by his own divine grace, just decided that what I'm about to do in these nine signs and wonders they're just going to happen. Don't worry, Israel. I got you. I got you. You just stand back and watch my miraculous power pour over the land. I got you. I got you. And so they are able to passively observe what God is doing. Much the way Christians, in air quotes, do today. We passively observe what's happening in the world. It becomes the subject of casual conversation, we are often guilty of not more deeply examining the affairs of our time to understand what God is doing among us and how he wants to use us in this darkness. We just talk about it. We just talk about the natural disasters. Earthquakes happening in places earthquakes have never happened before. We just talk about the record heat that's blanketing the world and it's proposed causes. We just talk about COVID and what it's doing economically and what it's doing sociologically. We just talk about it. But we are often guilty of not doing a, a more in-depth examination of what's happening in the world and how it connects to scripture and prophecy and how by it we can see the coming of the Lord very soon. Very soon. We just talk about it casually. So the first group that I want to speak to are us Christians. In God's kindness, he spares the Israelites from the flies and the boils and the dead animal carcasses and the hail and the darkness. And they didn't have to do a thing. By God's grace, he kept them. They just lived in the right place in the land of Goshen. And they were part of the right family, the Israelites. But for the final play, the people had to act. They had to do something. They had to fear the Lord and his judgments. They had to trust his promises and obey his commands. And they did. They sought out refuge in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Listen, in, I believe it's in the book of Chronicles, uh, or actually the, the, the last chapter of Ecclesiastes, where we are told, hear the whole duty of man. It's to fear God and obey his commandments. That's what God requires of us. A fear, not a trepidation, not an anxiety-ridden fear, but a reverence for his awesome power 
Believer, please hear me today. When I say that that's what distinguishes us from the world, we respect God's power. The writer in the Old Testament calls it terrible. Not terrible in our English sense of the word awful, but terrible in that it is awesome, overwhelming, supernatural power that only God himself has. And as believers, we believe that power. And we believe that God is still wielding that power in the earth today. That same power that comes and destroys things and, and pronounces judgment on the sins of humanity is pointed inward and raises the dead soul, heals the sick body, gives comfort to the troubled mind, mends broken relationships, makes a way out of no way, and meets needs. It's that power that we believe as Christians. The nine plagues, they could just move through passively. But at the tenth, when God said, now, y'all got to do some stuff. You're going to have to secure your own deliverance by demonstrating that you believe what I'm saying right now. I'm about to kill the firstborn of everything in the land. And the only way you're going to escape is by the blood of the lamb. Y'all know what I'm talking about today already before I even get to it. Thank you, Lord. Here's what I want to say to Christians. Just like the Jews in the land of Goshen, who were especially blessed by God just by virtue of the families they were born into and the land they occupied, being raised in a Christian home is like living in that land of Goshen. It's a blessing to us, right? Just because. We didn't get anything to do some of them blessings that came into our homes because of our saved and sanctified mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers, uncles and aunts. God simply put us in a Christian family and gave us Christian parents. And because of that, he spared us some hardness we would have otherwise have encountered. He gave us loving parents to care for us. We got to see what God was like through their behavior. And their lives. They taught us the gospel. They brought us to church. Hallelujah. We were sheltered. Well, under the power of God. It was a good thing. It was a blessing to be born into a Christian home. Like living in the land of Goshen. But being born in the right place. Or into the right family. Isn't enough to rescue us from the destroyer. From the angel of death when God's ultimate judgment comes we need more than just being born into the right family or being in the right place we need to be protected by the blood of the spotless lamb they call him Jesus we need to fear the Lord I said we need to fear the Lord the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The world grows wise, but in an evil way. They grow cunning and clever. They have evil imaginations that produce evil creations. We are not talking about cunningness or cleverness or innovativeness we are talking about wisdom that only comes from God because we respect the power of God as it's demonstrated through his son Jesus Christ we must fear the Lord and his judgments against sin we must have a living faith in Jesus Christ James says show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. The contrast was supposed to be an indictment against those who said they had a faith but did not have a life that matched that faith. Those who presumed that because they were part of a chosen class 
of people, they were active members of that class. Those who were born into Christian homes had only known church all their life and just automatically thought that because my mama and or my daddy were saved and brought me to church all my life and because I went to Sunday school and my name was on the roll, that my name was on heaven's roll. And what we are being told by the Passover story is it doesn't work that way. There are some things you will escape, but when it comes to the destruction you're going to have to demonstrate an active faith in Christ that's manifested in the way you live. You're going to have to fear God. Bless you, Lord. When God was going to send his total judgment on the world in the flood, by faith, Noah obeyed God. And it was demonstrated in that he built the ark to God's specification. And then he took his family into it. When God sent the destroyer to strike the firstborn in Egypt, by faith, Moses and the people obeyed God and put on the blood, put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. And they were saved from the judgment. And so for us, when God's judgment comes in our day to spotlight our human sin, the only thing that will matter is whether we have trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And Jesus is like the ark. Jesus is like the blood on the doorposts. We trust him and we are saved. So the first group was for us church babies. We are no more, no, no more Christians because we spent our life in the church than we are a car because we spend our time in the garage. We must have an active faith in Christ that's demonstrated in the way we live, the way we think, and the choices we make. The second group that I want to talk to, though, are for those who did not grow up in a Christian home. Those who did not have the luxury of having praying godly parents, who did not know the safety that exists in the home of a believer. I want to talk to those who were born in Egypt, who are Egyptians by citizenship, whose lives have been hard as a result. Maybe you feel that God is out to get you because of all the bad stuff that's happened in your life. Because of all the mess that you've had to go through. Because of everything you've had to endure. It may not be a swarm of flies. It not, may not be a plague of frogs. It may not be hail. It may not be the literal darkness that they experience. But you feel the affliction and the hardship of life. You've lived in darkness. And you felt it. You've suffered sickness. You've suffered pain, you've suffered abuse, you've suffered trauma, you've suffered loss. Whether it's your own sin or the consequences of your own choices, life has been hard. It's like you've been living in Egypt just when the plagues began to fall. I just want to tell you this morning that you don't have to stay in Egypt. You can come out. You don't have to be from a Christian family or have lived in a really nice neighborhood or have gone to the best schools or worn the best clothes. You don't have to be cultured and educated to be a member of God's family. Life may have been hard, but you don't have to stay in Egypt. I don't know if you caught it when we read verses 37 and verses 38, verse 38 of the 12th chapter of Exodus. But the scripture referred to a mixed multitude. Please understand, it wasn't just Jews who fled Egypt on that fateful day. There were Egyptians and others 
who believed the word of God and they saw their opportunity to get out of Egypt. So when the Jews packed their stuff and left, these other folks also packed their stuff and left. Did you know that there were some Egyptians in the Exodus? Did you know that there were some other slaves and prisoners of places that had been occupied by Egypt in the Exodus? They weren't all Jews. I guess what I'm saying to somebody today who's misguided in their assumptions about the church. Not everybody in church is a church baby. Not everybody in church grew up in the church. Not everybody in the church understands church culture. Some folks came in after a life of woundedness, a life of brokenness. They were unfamiliar with what we call church, but they did want to become familiar with who we call Jesus. And when they came into the church, they came not knowing our rules and our regulations. They came not familiar with the styles of the household, but it didn't matter to them. Because they wanted to get to know the householder. And his name is Jesus. I'm saying you don't have to stay in Egypt. You don't have to stay on the outside. You can come in the inside. Because the church is that mixed multitude. The Bible says that God is not a respecter of person, persons. For him, there is no Jew and barbarian and Greek. There is no male and female. There is no black and white. There is no rich and poor. There is no educated and undereducated. All God knows is souls. And he welcomes souls into his fold as long as they're covered by the blood of Jesus. So don't harden your heart like Pharaoh. Be like the Egyptians who saw the work of God and believed. God sent his judgment upon Egypt, one that included a total war on all human sin including those of his people who refused to put blood on the doorposts. And if he just sent the destroyer, or had he just sent the destroyer, everyone would have been lost. But he provided protection by the blood. And so mercy mingled with judgment. And then he established a meal to commemorate the event. Both the judgment and his mercy, both the judgment and his mercy. Passover is all about remembering God's judgment and his mercy. Through this meal, the people relived and reenacted this fundamental event in their history. The feast forged a link between the past, the present, and the future. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 42, we read these words. It was a night of watching by the Lord, that faithful night, to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So the same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. Every time, every time they celebrate Passover, they are looking back to that night in remembrance and they are looking forward to God's mercy in the future. Passover was a memorial for them so that they would not forget. Also so that they could teach their children about God's works and his ways. And it's a memorial for God, a petition from the people to the Lord. Don't forget us. Remember us. Remember your mercy and your covenant. But for us Christians, just like the Passover, communion is for the people of God, the followers of Christ. It's not for unbelievers. It's not for outsiders. If an outsider wants to join the covenant Passover meal, they need to put on the covenant sign in Exodus that was circumcision. Only the circumcised would be allowed to participate in covenant. But today, for us to participate in communion, we'd only have faith in Christ and be baptized, not just in water, but baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
That's God's righteous requirement of us today. If you are blood bought and blood covered and you are a person of faith and you have responded to God's command for the ordinance of baptism, not just in water, but baptized in the fiery Holy Spirit, then you too are an observer, not just of God's judgment, but of God's mercy and his grace. And God, we celebrate you for your grace today. Even in a COVID-ridden land, we celebrate you for your grace today. In the words of the psalmist, a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right side, but it shall not come nigh thee. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are saved. Is there anybody under the sound of my voice today that can declare, I am saved? Thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood for me. On Calvary, by that blood, I am saved. Father, we thank you today for your goodness and your grace your kindness towards us. We want to remain sensitive to your love. Your overwhelming love. So great is your love. You gave your only begotten son. To die for us. To shed his innocent blood. Upon Calvary's cross. And he. Who knew no sin. Became sin. For us. And conquered sin for us. Death, hell, and the grave for us. And he made a way back to the Father. Jesus did for us. And we're grateful, God. We're grateful. We're grateful. In the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 15, we are reminded by the writer. That our hearts, no matter what we're going through, no matter what the season brings, Father, we remember we are, we are counseled that our hearts should be filled with peace. That the peace of Christ should reign in our hearts. and That we should live with gratitude. God, we're grateful. We are grateful. We are grateful because you've been good to us. You've been better to us. <laughs> Now we've been to ourselves. We are grateful. If you are in the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and as this message was coming forward, the Spirit was speaking to you, convicting you of sin, and you want to be saved, you can be saved today. No matter what the enemy right now was whispering in your ear about your sins, you know you've been living in Egypt. You know you've been outside of the will of God, but it's time for you to come inside now. And this is how you do that. You declare your faith in Jesus Christ. Lord God, I know that I was a sinner, but I give my life to you and I repent of my sins. Repentance being turns away from my sins. I denounce my sins. I leave them in the past and I claim Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. And Father, I want you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and keep me in your will and teach me your will by your Spirit. If that's you today, if that's you today, if that's you today. What remains for you is to pray this prayer for with me that will, that will get you into the family of faith if you pray it sincerely and you receive the Holy Spirit into your life. I want you to do all that right now. We're going to do that right now. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for your loving kindness and your grace toward me. Repeat this prayer with me. Father God, I thank you for your loving kindness and your grace toward me. I know that I was born in sin. I was born in sin. Born in Egypt. Born in sin. That my whole personality, my whole being is shaped in iniquity. But I believe Jesus died for my sins. He paid the price. And I'm thankful to you, Father. And I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that having been crucified on the cross, he rose again. Three days later, all power in his hands. And that he lives now. 
But moreover, I want him to live in me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now, Father. I surrender myself. I have faith that you will do it now. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. That's my prayer. I pray it in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. I believe that now I am saved. I am saved. And that I will have a home in eternity with you, Father God, my creator. Thank you for making a way for me in Jesus' name. Now find somebody who belongs to a sanctified church, a church of sanctified people who are committed to the cause of Christ, who embrace the promises of God and the prescriptions of God and the word of God, and who are teaching it and preaching it and living it, and who can help you grow in faith. Reach out to somebody right now, as soon as you possibly can, a loved one, a neighbor, somebody. Tell them you've made a decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior. Ask them to help you grow in faith and in knowledge. And I want to be the first to welcome you into the family of faith. Good to have you, brother. Good to have you, sister. For all of you who are with us today, I am so grateful for each and every one of your lives. You are a star in the constellation of Christ, and you are shining for him. And I applaud you and celebrate you. And I am proud to be called your brother in Christ. Go with God. Be blessed. Until we meet again on this side or the other side, be safe. God bless you. Thank you all. We are